Hi, I'm Malika Bilal in for Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, is there room for dissent in Singapore? We look at why government actions against bloggers have some questioning the definition of free speech. So naturally, freedom of expression is always a hot topic online, and our digital producer, Dan Ming, is looking out for all of those conversations. And what are they saying? So we're asking people about the boundaries of free speech and what they should be. And we had this tweet here from Abdul Salam. He wrote, there are already limitations to freedom of speech. The absolute right doesn't exist anywhere. So we want to know, what do you think? Everyone at home, tweet me. Should there be restrictions to freedom of speech? And if so, what should those restrictions be? Tweet me with the hashtag AJStream. I'm Harsh Gupta. I'm a public policy columnist based in Singapore writing about India, and I am in the screen. In Singapore, how free is free expression? Well, the recent case of teenage blogger Amos Yee has restarted conversations about online censorship and the limits of dissent. In March, 16-year-old Amos posted an offensive image and video criticizing the legacy of late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. He was then detained for 50-some days and charged with obscenity and offending Christians. A second case involves blogger Roy Nung, who suggested there had been mismanagement of Singapore's retirement savings program. He was later sued by Prime Minister Lee Shen Long for defamation. Now, rights groups say the government has a history of suppressing political criticism through costly lawsuits and hate speech laws. So how have recent legal cases involving bloggers impacted free speech? But with us to talk about this is our panel from Singapore. Kirsten Han, a journalist and blogger in Singapore. Ken Quack is the writer and director of the film Unlucky Plaza. His 2012 film Sex, Violence, Family Values was censored by the government. Gilbert Chia is a journalist and managing director at Press Media Singapore. And Mike Ong, founder of the website Next Singapore Story. Welcome to all of our guests. Now, Let's get started on my laptop with the latest news in the Amos Yee case. This is from a tweet from Today Online. Amos Yee's lawyer has filed an appeal against his conviction and sentence. And you can see Amos there walking with his mother. So, Ken, why do you think this case in particular has really captivated uh, the imaginations of Singaporeans? And why is it uh, making such waves in society? Um, I think that the Amos Yee case uh, obviously garnered a lot of attention because of the timing of what he said. Uh, he had very strong views against our late uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and he voiced his views at a time where I think the country was in a state of national mourning. So apart from anything else, I think it was the timing. Uh, there are other issues, of course, but uh, I'll keep it short for now. Well, because Ken kept it short, I want to give our viewers a sense of what kinds of videos Amos Yee made, and, and the one in particular uh, that caused the offense. Take a look. Lee Kuan Yew was a horrible person. Because everyone is scared. Everyone is afraid that if they say something like that, they might get into trouble, which, give Lee Kuan Yew credit, that was primarily the impact of his legacy. But I'm not afraid. So if Lee Sien Long wishes to sue me, I will oblige to. So he went on to compare the former prime minister to Jesus and Chris, crit, criticize Christianity, which is what he was later convicted for. So Ken, what reaction have people had to seeing that video, which was posted on YouTube? Uh, well, obviously, there were all many different kinds of reactions from what I, I gathered from reading uh, in the news and from uh, chatting with people around me. Some were offended, some who were uh, loyal and, or, or, or very supportive or, of Mr. Lee's legacy were uh, incredibly offended. Others thought, hey, you know, he's, he's a 16-year-old uh, boy, he's mouthing off. Uh, but he doesn't deserve to be sued and certainly not, didn't deserve to be uh, incarcerated for five, uh, sorry, 50 over days, I think it was. Uh, so, I mean, a variety of reactions uh, on both ends of the spectrum. My own reaction was uh, simply that, that it was a group of 30-odd 
ordinary citizens that picked up the phone, called the police, and said, this guy has offended me. And therefore, this guy should be sent to court, uh, charged for something, uh, and, and punished for his views. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I personally, I, I found that incredibly difficult to stomach, uh, not only because uh, I disagree with it, also because I'm, I'm an artist, and I, I obviously lean towards uh, more freedom than less. Um, it, is, it is those 30 people, those 30 people that picked up the phone and called the police that scared the hell out of me. Because, uh, you know... Can I, can I just if, drum in here? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, sorry, Ken. Hey, uh, by the way, I love your movie. Oh, thank you. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that uh, there's something very important that we need to clarify here is that these 30 people may have done that, but he was charged under the laws of Singapore, which are, um, and he was charged for, for, for hate speech, basically, the sedition laws. I don't think that these mm. 30 people or even 300 or 3,000 uh, could have just told the government arrest him. Um, without no, no, no. I don't. I'm, I'm not saying that them. that's what they said. I'm saying that they called in to say that they were offended. Now, I, I'm saying that they called in to say that they were offended. And to me, uh, a if what this 16 year old boy says is powerful enough to hurt your feelings, or hurt your religious feelings, hurt your political feelings, even then I think that your political uh, views or your religious feelings are, 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 must be incredibly fragile. So, uh, I sure, mean, but I think he's, that he's people have a Ken, right Ken to Gilbert. call in and say, sorry. I, I, I just wanted to inter I would like to bring Kirsten into this conversation as well. So Kirsten, we asked whether um, the Amos Yee case, what implications it has for freedom of expression in Singapore. And Hasina wrote in, she said, Thanks. I think that there are two separate issues. Those who support free expression may not necessarily support Amos Yee, and those who want greater freedom seek better champions than a volatile teen blogger. So, Kirsten, what do you think about these criticisms of Amos Yee, that he's the wrong poster boy for a movement for more freedom of speech? I think we don't get to choose our poster boys, and so we, we have to also, if we believe in free speech, we have to stand up to people. We, stem up for people we might not agree with. So there was actually a lot of new ones. At a, one day before Amos's sentencing, there was a protest in Singapore, and there was actually a, new, a lot of new ones in the supporters there, even the speakers who were speaking for freedom of speech. Some said, actually, I don't agree with what Amos did. Some said, I actually think Amos is a bit of a brat, but he did not deserve what was happening to him. And I think I should jump in to add on the previous um, comments. Uh, Amos was not charged under sedition. He was charged uh, under another section of the law for wounding religious feelings. So it wasn't so much hate speech as in it hurt someone's feelings. And I think that that's a conversation we need to have. Like, is the bar too low if, if all we're talking about is hurt feelings? Does it make it too easy for people to claim offense and then have the law kick in like that just because 30 people called up and said, my feelings are hurt yeah, by this yeah. video? No, okay. But, but I think that if you actually look at hate speech laws um, across Europe, uh, and uh, Canada and Australia, the wounding of feelings is part of the hate speech law. I totally agree that you know we can have a conversation, we should have a conversation as to whether or not we should have hate speech laws and how high or low the bar should be. But I think in this case, if you look at Amos, and I'm, I personally feel uh, that you know he's he's a young guy, they they shouldn't have cracked down on him this way. But if you were to look at this as a case of uh, hate speech or wounding the feelings of people. Singapore is n by no means the only country in the world that has these kinds of laws. And if you look across Europe, there are many people who are persecuted for what they say about Jews, um, about Christians, about Catholics, um, and even about the LGBT community. So, you know, I think that it's important that we at least understand that Singapore is by no means the only country uh, who, who, who has these laws. And very importantly, you know, in the week after Lee Kuan Yew's death, there were many comments online that were really, really very anti-Lee Kuan Yew. None of those people were arrested. I think that, you know, if uh, Amos had not talked about Christianity, 
they really couldn't have done anything about it because there's no so, law to try uh, Gilbert, then, I mean, that's still an interesting point that you raised that Kirsten brought up in talking about is the bar too low. So, Mike, I want to bring you in here on your answer to Kirsten's question and whether or not, if it's too low or if it's not, does Singapore need these laws to help ensure racial, uh, religious harmony in, in such a multicultural society? <clears throat> Let me just comment uh, for what you just mentioned uh, of the reaction that is uh, that is shown in the public. I myself went out to the public uh, during the day when we were having the uh, condolences where you know our prime minister just passed away. And as I was writing some of the, the notes in the wall and some of the, the things that I uh, gave as a tribute, I, I, I have heard a lot of conversation both by the adults and the young people. And they, they were very, very unhappy, disgusted, angry. And in fact, I have to do a role trying to mellow down the, the reaction. Now, as far as the situation in Singapore is concerned, we, we need to always remember not to compromise with meritocracy and multiracialism. And I think we need to have clear line between openness and at the same time, we must also have boundaries. Well, Mike, you mentioned the Lee Kuan Yew tribute wall, so I pulled it up here on my uh, laptop. This is uh, the wall where people wrote their remembrances. There's one in particular um, that I'm scrolling to here. This is from Valerie, and she says, Singapore will not, would not be what it was if it were not for the former prime minister. Um, and you can see lots of other remembrances like that there. Dan, what's the community saying? So we have people Could weighing I just in. Jump in. Could I just jump in about a yeah, previous go ahead. comment? Go ahead, Kirsten. Um, so I, I don't think we should kid ourselves that Singapore is a multiracial harmonious society. I don't think we should kid ourselves that we have hate speech laws. I don't think Singapore has actually had a conversation about hate speech laws because we've had the most horrendous hate speech against uh, LGBT people. We've had really offensive things said about ethnic minorities and religious minorities in Singapore, and nothing has happened to them. And, you know, if we really had this multiracial, harmonious society, we would be focused more on anti-discrimination rather than clamping down on freedom of speech so people don't get feelings hurt. We would be doing things about banning the fact that property agents and landlords can say they are banning Indians from renting their houses because Indians there's some, somehow there's some sort of discrimination against Indians there because of stereotypes that they can't be trusted, that they're smelly. We should be doing something about these things if we really wanted to have a multiracial society rather than saying it's the speech we should arrest people according to the law and that teenagers should be arrested. Mm. So just to transition here, can we also ask people about the case of Roy Nung, who was a blogger that was sued by Prime Minister Lee for comments that he made on his blog about the Prime Minister? And um, Sean sent us this video comment talking about the effect of self-censorship. Take a listen to this. On the issue of self-censorship, I find myself uh, self-censoring on two occasions. And the first would be when <clears throat> I feel like my opinion has nothing to add to the discussion or the debate or the zeitgeist. Well, the second occasion, I'm quite sorry to add, is when, when my views don't align with the state's position. And that's purely out of fear of a, a sort of state reprisal or government action taken against me and I think that's quite sad because I would like to say what I like to say freely uh, and I think people should be able to hear and discuss my opinions. So Ken what do you think about this do you think that a prime minister suing a blogger could lead to people self-censoring with their comments online? Um, well if you if you listen to what Sean says then I guess the answer is yes but I must also add that at the end of the day, what you want to say is up to you. You know, your views are your responsibility. So if you believe in something, I think you should say it. But that's my view. I think you should say it. Of course, in Singapore, there is, uh, I've, I've always felt that there, there is still a residual climate of fear uh, when it comes to discussing um, politics, when it comes to discussing uh, sensitive issues like race and religion. But uh, I do think that uh, a lot of emphasis has been played on what, this, on, on what the state does to individuals through defamation laws, uh, through uh, implementing any number of other laws, uh, whether it's addition, uh, whether it's um, penal code laws. 
protecting people's feelings, as Kirsten mentioned. But in the end, it's about the individual. W the, will the individual uh, stand by uh, his right to speak? There's nothing actually stopping you in Singapore from, from saying what you feel. So, Gilbert, do, do you, it, Gilbert, I, I just want to bring I, Gilbert I, I in here, know. picking up on what you're saying. Can Gilbert, do you self censor? Do you find this being true? In your no, I agree with I agree I agree with Ken. I think that you know you just need to go online and see the things that Singaporeans are writing about. I think the internet has changed everything. He's absolutely right in that there is a lack of diversity of views in the mainstream media, but in online it's 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 crazy. I've seen things online that you know have raised my eyebrows. I live 20 years in the U.S., so I'm no stranger to the whole thing about free speech and all of that. You know, I, I'm I'm a big advocate of that. And I think online in Singapore, Singaporeans aren't really afraid. I think the line you don't cross basically there are two lines, and we can debate whether or not these lines should even be there. One line you don't cross is the is the religion line. I agree with what Christian said. I think that there's a lot of racism in Singapore. There's horrendous uh, xenophobia. And that needs to be addressed. But if you're commenting online, the two lines, you, the two things you don't cross basically would be talking about religion and denigrating another religion. And the other thing would be personal uh, accusation of corruption or dishonesty against any politician. I think that, again, you can discuss whether or not that needs to be there. Um, but if you don't cross these two lines, you can say anything you want. You know, you, I can go online right now if I'm so inclined to say that I think this government is terrible. I think we need to vote them out. I think that everyone there is an idiot. Nothing's going to happen to me. And I think that you just need to go yes, online. People you do, see a lot of I, I think people do say that, that. But um, I think for the issue of corruption, I don't think anyone is saying that, you know, it becomes a right to deliberately defame someone. But I think for Roy Nung's case, what, we, what people are saying is that with the Prime Minister, who has so much power and so many avenues to correct the um, defamation that has occurred, why did he choose a court? Why, why did he choose the court case? Why did he choose a case that would lead to damages that would absolutely destroy a regular Singaporean? Because, you know, Roy offered 5000 it was rejected, 10000 it was rejected. So he's looking sure. at I mean, a long, I think long that time of bankruptcy a, a now. discussion as so to could, how could, the Prime could Minister he have not chosen should another respond. Route? Right. I want to bring Mike you know, in I mean, here because I, I saw him nod, uh, Gilbert, when you were speaking. Um, Mike, does this speak to a cultural attitude in Singapore? And is it unfair to uh, for people to put Western notions of freedom of expression um, and apply them in Singapore when they shouldn't be applied? What, what, what's your take on that? Actually, what, what I feel most is the recent... Um, over assertive, over aggressive, uh, into your face kind of uh, conversation, and and uh, and that kind of uh, lack of value, lack of control, lack of responsibility of oneself, and and and, and also the attitude and the tone when you say it, because if you say something and you hurt someone, and immediately animosity is just created, and you are you are causing the immediate divide. And when, once that thing uh, happen, then there will be a lot of fear, and there will be a lot of distancing, and there will be unnecessary uh, consequences, which I've, I've seen in 1964 and 1969 personally. So, Mike, you're saying it's about tone. So if uh, Amos Lee and Roy Nung had a different tone when they criticized the prime minister, former and current, then we would have had a different outcome? And not only the, uh, the, the tone, because the, the tone is part of your, your languaging, your body language, but also uh, get your facts right. Make sure you get your facts right. And, and, I, and I have also, to jump in here and say that, I have yeah. to jump in here if you don't mind, and, and say that I, yes. I completely agree with the latter point of uh, getting the facts right. What I disagree yeah. is on um, prescribing one's tone. I mean, who are you to, dis to decide what tone we are meant to adopt? I mean, this is a country of five million people. You want everyone to adopt the same tone, we're going to start sounding a bit like sheep, really. We're going to sound monotonal. I mean, that's, that's, that's complete nonsense. Uh, what, no, and well, and, when and I, I think this tone, feeds into... Go on. Yeah. When I talk about tone, I'm not talking about trying to copy everyone uh, the way you speak. I'm talking about social norm. I'm talking about social value. Yeah, but I'm who talking defines about social uh, norms? Who defines accepted. social values? No, who defines your social norms? Who defines your social values? 
the but government. But you see, there are certain things when we I know I, you, I, can't, I you can't just use uh, abusive language. You can uh, just be saying something that make comparison with crimes and Lee Kuan Yew as a dictator. If I could so, just Kirsten, I hear yeah, you I wanting to jump in. I, I love that Ken asked a question that got everyone thinking, but I want to get our community in here because I know that they also want to say something on that point. Yeah, so I'd like to jump back to something that Mike mentioned about consequences, and we have people weighing in on the issue of what the consequences are. Socially, Cal writes, he says, certain taboo subjects like race and religion are heavily regulated, too many sweeping laws are moderating discourses. But then Abu Jalil, Jalil disagrees. He says, to me, I think that there are need, there's a need for laws because without them, the racism of religions can turn, out, can turn into violence and crisis. So Kirsten, I want to ask you about that. Yeah, you know, what, actually, what that's is, actually. Uh, sorry, Kirsten, sorry, what, what, is the, what is the fear here with, um, with certain comments? What is the government afraid of? I think the fear that we've always been told is that, you know, Singapore is very vulnerable as a country, that, you know, the stability that we have was hard won and should not be taken for granted. So it's kind of like a we trade off free expression for this stability, for this safety. But just going back to Mike's point, the thing about, you know, escalating online arguments, the thing about tone, the thing about using vulgar language, I don't think these are problems that would be solved by regulating speech even more you know we need to practice singaporeans need to practice how to disagree how to argue how to actually talk and instead of keeping it all pent up and then getting very angry anonymously over the internet because you wouldn't dare say it any other way but the more practice I, I, we have sorry. actually talking then the you know these things can be now there will always be some people who will always be you know very strident, very loud, very vulgar. But you know, free, clamping down on free speech does not solve these problems. And Kirsten, I dare say we're giving it a try here on the stream today. Gilbert, I know you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that you know, we talk about the consequences of unbridled free speech. You only need to look at what happened with the Charlie Hebdo. No one's incident. ever talked about um, unbridled free speech. No one's ever talked about yes, unbridled I, I, free speech. I, I, and I, I like to agree. Nobody. Yes, yes. I, I don't think that anyone here is talking about unbridled free speech. And, uh, you know, whenever we get into this sort of discussion, uh, conservatives tend to bring out the worst case scenario, which have, frankly, very, very little application to Singapore. There is a, there is a perception in Singapore that free speech uh, is, is, uh, is a selfish, uh, socially irresponsible uh, a, a right. And and I, I I simply cannot agree with that view. I think that no, I I, I don't agree with that view yeah, either. Yeah. I think that free speech is important, but I think that there is no country in the world where free speech is completely without repercussions, and uh, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. I think that certain restrictions yes, we're not are necessary. Saying, we're not saying we're not arguing for unbridled free speech. I don't think, Gilbert. I think we're saying that there is a perception of free speech generally uh, uh, in Singapore that it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to say what you really think. And it's dangerous to allow people to speak their prejudices, to air their grievances. Uh, and I disagree with that. I think that that's the only way you can tell what people are thinking and feeling. And therefore, that's how we have a discussion about you know what we disagree sure, sure. about but i don't you know? see that as um I, I mean i don't see that myself here in singapore i think that people feel very free to comment online um i agree with your point about the mainstream media but i think that online um you know very very many people are very open about commenting and criticizing um i read the comments all the time you know and uh, i think that's healthy i agree with you i think that's very healthy um, but my so point Gilbert, I'm actually going to pause that. you there with it being healthy that there are comments online because that's where this conversation is going to continue. I'll give the last word to our community, Dan. Yeah, so we have a debate going about these cases and these laws. Gretchen in Singapore writes, these laws are important as they help keep the country and the people safe from any sort of harm. But then Benjamin says, in a democratic country, a 16-year-old wouldn't face criminal prosecution for airing an unpopular or rude view. That's an interesting point. Thanks to our community and also thanks to our guests, Kirsten Hahn, Ken Quek, Gilbert Chia, and Mike Ong. On the next stream, can technology be racist? We'll take a look at what happens when tech designers don't account for diversity. Thanks for watching. See you next time.